Welcome to the World History One Lecture Series. At the end of each slide, there will be a 10-second delay. Use this time to pause the presentation and complete your notes. When you are done, push play and you will move forward. This lecture will begin in 5 seconds. Welcome to World History One Lecture 6.2 on Roman Social Structure and Government in the Republic, and welcome to the Roman Republic! Uh, that's like our capital, dude. So what am I trying to say? I'm saying that the United States of America is a lot like the Roman Republic. How so? Let me show you. The United States has representative democracy. In this country, we elect officials who go to Washington to make our laws. We had the same thing in Rome. It's called the Assembly. In our country, we have the President. This is a person who represents us in foreign affairs, who controls the army, and who enforces the laws in our country. Rome had something similar. These two guys, they are the Council. And the United States has social structure, and so did Rome. So the United States is a lot like the Roman Republic. But as you will see, there are some major differences. With that said, let's go to the next slide. Rome is a civilization, and the city of Rome is the center of that civilization. But this doesn't mean that Rome was always governed the same way. Instead, there are four separate time periods where Rome is governed differently. Rome is like Greece in that it starts as a monarchy. We have Roman kings who are in charge of everything. Like Greece, Rome turns into a democracy. But unlike Greece, Rome does not turn into a direct democracy. Instead, the Roman Republic is a representative democracy that lasts from 509 BCE until 60 BCE. Roman citizens are electing individuals who are going to Rome to represent them in the government. Then Rome slips backwards. Rome is a dictatorship ruled by Julius Caesar from 60 to 44 BCE. And after a series of civil wars, Rome is an empire from 44 BCE until it ends in 476 AD. Rome is a monarchy, a republic, a dictatorship, and ultimately an empire. Go to the next slide. Like other civilizations we've studied this year, Rome has a class system. Luckily for us, this system is straightforward. Roman society is split into three classes. Patricians, that's the highest class, include the male nobility, we call them aristocrats, and the male ruling class. These are government and religious leaders. Plebeians are the male majority, and they include landowners, townspeople, merchants, and small farmers. So basically you have the patricians in the upper class, and the plebeians, that's pretty much everyone else. Slaves are men and women of all races who are forced into involuntary servitude based on conquest. Here's the thing. There is tension between the patricians and the plebeians about who's in charge. Go to the next slide. One way to manage tension between patricians and plebeians was to grant certain people citizenship. Citizenship was held by all patrician and plebeian men and extended to a few privileged foreigners, usually local leaders and aristocrats of a conquered people. So if we pull up our class pyramid here, you'll see that patricians and plebeians are citizens. Women and slaves were not citizens. And you'll see this unit that Rome was a male-dominated society. Citizens could vote, but they were required to pay taxes and serve in the military. And more importantly, patrician and plebeians held 
different levels of citizenship, which allowed patricians to hold more power in society. So looking back at our class chart, patricians held more power, plebeians held less power, and women and slaves held no power. Go to the next slide. Roman citizens could be involved in their government, and Roman government is the foundation for modern representative democracy. But that doesn't mean that Rome's government looks like our government in the United States, but there are similarities. There are three branches of Roman Republican government. There are two councils. They are like co-presidents, and they are the most powerful people in Rome. Then there's the Senate who are appointed, and the assemblies, they are elected, and they act like our Congress. And finally, there are magistrates. Those are judges, and they answer directly to the council. Now, there are two rules that keep patricians in power. Rule number one, only a patrician can be a council. Only a patrician can hold the highest office in Rome. And rule number two, only patricians could serve in the Senate, but something's going to happen here. This will change after the Council of Orders in 300 BCE when the plebeians revolt and they get more power by being allowed to join the Senate. Here's the thing. The only elected people in Rome are the Roman assemblies. Go to the next slide. The United States has three equal branches of government. Not so in Rome. Councils are the most powerful men in the Roman Republic. And two councils represent the power of the old Roman monarchy. What does that mean? It means that these guys represent the old power of the kings, so they are also going to be treated like kings. Councils are appointed by the Senate to a one-year term and then they're made a senator for life. Councils will always be involved in Roman government. Councils lead the army, they serve as judges, and they represent Rome in foreign affairs. Here's the thing. One council can veto the other council. So if one council makes a treaty with a foreign nation, the other council can turn around and say, uh-uh, no way, I veto that. In times of war, the Senate can appoint a council to be a dictator for six months. This might become a problem later in Roman history. Go to the next slide. Councils may have been the most powerful people in Rome, but they are not all powerful, and other citizens will be part of the government. The Roman Senate is powerful. They appoint and advise the councils. No money is spent without their consent. and They do not make laws, but what they say goes. They are not elected, but they are picked by the council. In other words, these are the patricians who work to keep patricians in power and to move Roman civilization in a direction the patricians want it to go. The Roman assemblies are elected. They make or reject laws and decide issues like war and peace. And they have tribunes. Tribunes are powerful plebeians who run the assemblies and can bring issues to the Senate. In other words, this is the voice of the common people. They make the laws because they're going to have to live under them and they get to talk about war and peace because they will ultimately fight the battles. Here's the thing. Councils, senators, and assemblymen all have to follow a certain set of rules. The government follows the 12 tables. They were created in 455 BCE to stop a plebeian revolt. The plebeians were upset because the patricians were basically walking all over them. And they represent a codification or writing down of Roman law and provide an understanding of legal and social protection and civil rights between patricians and plebeians. What does that mean? 
It basically boils down to this. Patricians, you have these rights. Plebeians, you have these rights. And these rules will keep the peace between these two classes of people so that Rome can thrive. That's it for this lecture, and I look forward to seeing you in class.